morning we're going to continue in our series marked by change. This is our second week into this and today we're talking about the agent of change. We're talking about the Holy Spirit. But you know when you look at your, our lives, you know we all probably, if we're honest, there's something about our lives that we would like to have change. But how? How do we bring about this change? I mean, we'll all experience change in our lives. Some good, some not so good. But the point is, people all over the place are looking to get help to make the changes in their life that they believe are necessary. But how do we get there? I come across uh, some surveys from McKinsey and Company. Uh, a recent survey says indicates that the percent of change programs that are successful today are still only 30%. Harvard Business Review says the brutal fact is that about 70% of all change initiatives fail. Forbes Tower says we found that only 25% of change management initiatives are successful over the long term. So basically what it's saying is that between 60 and 70% of what we do to try to bring about change fails. Always. Great statistic, huh? But yet, Jesus came knowing all of these things. He came knowing that we needed this change. Do we realize that this past year, $549 million were spent in self-help books to try to bring about change in our lives? In addition to that, $10.4 billion were spent in all the other things that we would call agents of change to bring about change. And what's the survey tell us? 25, maybe 30% actually brings about a change. And what I've discovered in those changes, typically it's only for a short time, not for a lifetime. Jesus came knowing that humanity was looking for change. He knew what we were up against. He knew the challenges. He knew that we needed something different. You know, when we look at these agents of change, we'd probably pay anything for a real agent of change, wouldn't we? But we've come to realize that it doesn't matter how much we have. We don't have the means to give that agent of change that will bring about the change that Christ is looking for. Jesus came saying, I am the change. And through me is the only time that you can have that kind of change that you truly desire. But you know, when Jesus was talking, when he was sharing about what this was going to be, this agent of change, this was prior to his death. So he knew what was in front of him. He knew the cost, and he knew that not one of us could pay the cost, but it was only him. But he needed them to understand that in this change that I'm going to bring into your life, there's going to be some cost involved in it, not just from me, but also from you. There's going to be moments where you have to suffer in my name. Some of you will even die because of me. And he says, if you try to stand in the midst of this change in your own strength, you will fail 100% of the time. But he says, the agent of change that I want to bring to you is something greater than you've ever hoped or imagined. And he began to give them this truth we find in John 16. In John 16, verse 7, it says, But in fact, Jesus is saying, It is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world of its sin, of all God's righteousness, and the coming judgment. So Jesus is really laying it out and saying, This agent of change is the Holy Spirit. And it's going to come to you only when I go away. See, they were so desperate to hold on to Jesus because that was what was comfortable. That was their stronghold. But he says, when I go, something greater than even me is going to come into you, my spirit. And it's going to be that agent of change that will bring about the change that you cannot bring on your own. And so many of us miss that. Now, this idea that Jesus was bringing about the spirit guiding, this wasn't a new idea. They had seen how the Spirit had guided before, but it was different. They had seen how he guided, how he empowered from the outside. Momentarily, he was there. But this new truth that Jesus was bringing, was saying, the Spirit's not going to guide you momentarily. 
just be among you. He says, the spirit that I give to you is going to dwell within you. That was the new truth. That was the new idea that he was bringing. He says, after my death, the power of the Holy Spirit is going to be different than anything you've ever experienced in your life. It's going to dwell within you. Well, if you look at Romans 8.11, we begin to see the power of the Spirit. Verse 11 says, the, the Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. Can you imagine what they were thinking when they first heard this? What does this mean that the spirit's going to live within me? I mean, they understood what was to come, but they haven't yet walked through his death, burial, and resurrection. But on the other side of the grave, they began to realize that there was power. In the resurrection. And he began to say the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave is going to live within you. Now that was a hard concept for them to understand. It definitely took some getting used to. I mean, think about it. To have this kind of power in you that raised Jesus now dwells within. What an amazing thing. But then to think about the Holy Spirit taking up residency within your life. Now, I don't know about you, but that probably took a little bit of getting used to. I know it still does for me because I'm a pretty private person. So to think that somebody's dwelling within me, knowing everything about me, it's kind of like, okay, I can either adhere to this and surrender to that and realize the impact and change that the Spirit can bring, or I can be in constant battle with the Spirit that Christ has given. Now, the Holy Spirit doesn't take up residency in our, in our lives because he has no place to live. I can assure you that. But he takes up residency in our lives because he wants to bring about a supernatural change from within. Do we believe in that power? That's the question this morning. You know, we often get stuck in life, don't we? A lot of things can throw us. And it can look something like this. A family went on vacation. They wanted to do something very, very different. Something they were not accustomed to. They said, there's some rough terrain out here. Let's, let's rent one of those Jeeps. And let's go on this rough terrain and let's go be adventurous. And they thought they had everything they needed. The guy says, take this Jeep, it'll get you wherever you want to go. If you have an issue, just call me. But the thing was, when they got out in that rough terrain, they found themselves getting stuck. And they couldn't understand because he said, this Jeep will get you through whatever you need to get through. So they call in, and he comes out, and he looks and quickly realizes. He says, you didn't engage the four-wheel drive. He said, this Jeep will get you out. But you didn't understand the power that was here to pull you through. The same thing is true for us. We are marked by the Spirit, given the Spirit. And sometimes we have to be reminded, why are you stuck in life? You have not engaged with the Holy Spirit to pull you through. I've given you everything you need. But sometimes we need to be reminded. Sometimes we need to see how this works. And Jesus has given us this guide, the Holy Spirit, to live within us. You know, frequently we encounter these difficulties in life, don't we? We find ourselves getting stuck, but we have a marvelous power that lives within us when we have a life that is surrendered to Jesus. We just have to choose to engage and allow his power to overwhelm us, to pull us through. You know, many times we don't feel inclined, do we, to do the things that maybe God calls us to because we don't feel it. But see, when we start moving in our lives in a way that can't be explained outside of God. When we start experiencing things that saying, man, this is not my nature. Why am I doing this? It's because we have finally, finally surrendered to the Spirit's leading. And when we have things in our lives that we cannot explain outside of God, His movement in our lives, then we know that we're living in the power of the Holy Spirit because it is of God, not of our flesh. But that's where He's called us to live. And it's hard to get there. You know, we have a choice this morning. Actually, we have a choice every day. We have a choice to follow the change of life that is minimal, limited to the flesh. Or we have a choice to follow the change that brings about life eternal. That's a choice that we have to make every day as we walk through this. You know, when we live with a change that won't last, we miss out on everything that God wants us to have. But when we begin to live in the change that will bring life 
true life, we begin to see his promise and his provision. We begin to see the things that the world says can't happen because the world will tell you, you've gone too far, you failed too often, you've dug a hole too deep, you can't pull through. No, you can't. But God can pull you through with his spirit. So we definitely want to know what this agent of change is all about. And we're going to open his word today, and we're going to go through it. So be ready. We're going to have a lot of scripture to go through today. If you can't follow me in your, in your Bible, look up to the screen as we go through this. So true change can only come through God's spirit. That's what we have to believe. True change can only come through God's spirit. Now, each of us have been given that free will, right? Free will to choose that which will last only for a moment or free will to choose to follow the change that will last for a lifetime you know satan wants you to believe that you can do this on your own he really does he wants to convince you that you don't need god in your life he wants you to be able to say i've got this god you know we may sprinkle a little religion in there and and say a few prayers and say lord this is what i want this is where i'm going so go ahead and bless it that's where we want to live But when we are being guided by his spirit, it changes everything. We begin to surrender to his will, his desires. But we have to have something to reveal these truths in us. Because I know that we won't come to this understanding on our own. Not in the flesh. In fact, if you turn with me to 1 Corinthians, we find this in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 10 and following. It says, but it was to us that God revealed these things by his spirit. For his spirit searches out everything and shows us God's deep secrets. No one can know a person's thoughts except the person's own spirit. And no one can know God's thoughts except God's own spirit. And when we have received God's spirit, not the world's spirit, so we can know the wonderful things God has freely given us. It's about a revealing. It's about changing our mindset, allowing the spirit to move us and guide us and massage our hearts and our minds so that we begin to see God. In the midst of all of this, because God knows, trust me, God knows our vulnerable state. He knows the sin-fallen world that we live in, that it's always biting at our heels, trying to draw us in. He knows this, and he wants us to give us the agent of change. He wants to give us a spirit that will conquer our spirit of fear, our spirit of selfishness, our spirit of defeat. He wants us to give us a spirit of victory. And it comes through his Holy Spirit, marking our lives. You know, Jesus knew the battle of the flesh probably more than anyone else. And he relied on the strength that God Almighty was able to give to him to endure the cross. And he's been trying to speak this for generations. It wasn't just with Jesus. But if you look in Jeremiah, chapter 17, I love this portion of Scripture. In verse 5 it says, this is what the Lord says, cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the Lord. They're like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited salty land. But blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. That was being spoken a long time before Jesus came on the scene. But this truth has continued from generation to generation that his provision is perfect. And he wants to give us something greater than all of this. Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit knew that left to our own, okay, left to our own, we have no hope for change. We have no hope for victory in our lives apart from them. But through the empowering spirit of God, we're able to overcome whatever battle is thrown at us. We're able to have that victory in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. But it's through the guiding of the Spirit that brings us back to the point of focus, which is Jesus. It always will be Jesus. I want you to listen to this. In Titus, this is a truth about us. (laughs) Once we, okay, it includes all of us, were foolish and disobedient. We were misled and became slaves to many lusts and pleasures. Our lives were full of evil and envy, and we hated each other. 
But when God our Savior revealed his kindness and love, he saved us. Not because of the righteous things we have done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and a new life through the Holy Spirit. He generously poured out the Spirit upon us through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Because of his grace, he declared us righteous and gave us confidence that we will inherit eternal life. Is that not a good and wonderful truth? As we hear this, we realize that we were lost, but by the Spirit, we were found. Not just sprinkled over, but generously poured over his Spirit on us to overflowing. He's not giving us just enough to get by. He's giving us more than enough to be more than conquerors. And it's by the power of his spirit in us that we're able to do this. But if the spirit is given to bring about change, change for what? Change for why? Those are the questions that we begin to ask. What is this new birth, this new life, that he's talking about. In John, we get a little more insight on this idea. In John 3, verse 3, it says, Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. What do you mean? exclaimed Nicodemus. How can an old man go back into his mother's womb and be born again? Jesus replied, I assure you, No one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and the Spirit. Humans can reproduce only human life, but the Holy Spirit gives birth to spiritual life. So don't be surprised when I say to you, you must be born again. We hear of this new birth, this new spiritual nature about us, and it comes through the Holy Spirit. But yet we still fall back on what? We fall back on these these strategies of change that we have in our lives, these self-helps, these points of accountability. And I'm going to tell you, not, in, not that they're bad, but they cannot provide what God can provide through his spirit, true change. They may be a help in the process, but without the spirit, there was not going to be the change that we're looking for. The spirit brings about new life. The spirit brings about a future for us to be lived out today. He gives us insight and reveals these things so that we can live in that truth. But this is what I love. All can be marked and equipped by God's agent of change. All of us. Everyone can have this promise. Everyone can have this empowering. Every one of us. You know, Jesus wasn't given this promise to just a select few. But anyone who was radically changed by his sacrifice and willing to be surrendered to his call. But it's a choice, isn't it? That each and every one of us has to make. You know, there was a time when Peter was preaching the good news. A large gathering of people were there. They were listening intently, hanging on every word that he was talking about. When he talked about new life, being born again, about Jesus and what he wanted to give. And finally, they interrupted him in his preaching. They said, wait, wait, wait. I hear what you're saying, but what must we do to be saved? We hear all this wonderful truth, and you say it's for all, but what must we do? Well, let's look at this. In Acts 2.38, Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sin and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. A promise, a guarantee for each one who walks through this point of obedience, this point of surrender. When we hear these words, again, it was still new to them, this idea of indwelling. What does it mean to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? Basically, the indwelling is when God takes up permanent residency within each of the believers that have surrendered their life And we are marked by his spirit that dwells within us. Now we see evidence of this in the Old Testament where the spirit guided them. But it was among them. It wasn't in them. That is the difference that Christ is bringing through his resurrection. He says now the spirit dwells within. 
takes up residency within. You are now the temple that holds my spirit. So how are we doing with that temple? Are we allowing him to have free reign in our lives? Are we allowing him to move us and change us? You know, Jesus brought this forth. He says, this new birth, this new life is from me, but it's through my spirit. And we see this promise in the word of God of the absolute guarantee that in and through baptism, you will be forgiven, but you will also be marked and you will be given the indwelling. Now we see evidence, now hear me, we see evidence in God's word that those, there were people that were given the indwelling of the spirit apart from baptism or prior to. But I want the absolute assurance and the absolute assurance gives it to us in baptism. And why wouldn't we want to go through the beauty of all that Jesus did himself? All I need to know is Jesus says, do it, I'm good. In the great commission that we carry out, Jesus made this a point of reference. Go, make disciples, and what? Baptize them. Because it wasn't just about a thing they were doing. It was about the empowering of their lives through the Spirit. Because see, sometimes we forget that the Spirit can be among us and influence our lives. But I want the assurance that he's dwelling within. That he has freedom to rule and reign in my mind and my heart. This is a beautiful thing that Jesus brought to his people. This whole truth, though, initially was given to the Jews, God's chosen people. But I said it was for all, didn't I? And Jesus made it very apparent that this was not just for the Jews. This is for anyone who surrenders their life. In fact, if you look in Ephesians, we'll see this truth. In Ephesians 1, 13, it says, And now you Gentiles have also heard the truth, the good news that God saves you, And when you believed in Christ, he identified you as his own by giving you the Holy Spirit, whom he promised long ago. The Spirit is God's guarantee that he will give us the inheritance he promised and that he has purchased us to be his own people. He did this so we would praise and glorify him. There is a purpose in this, that we are being marked in that moment. We have been marked, but will we be changed? It's a great question. I'm glad you asked. It comes with the understanding that the Holy Spirit will never force his way into your life. We can be marked, but it doesn't guarantee that we'll be changed unless we surrender daily our will to his. I mean, just because you have a gym membership, that fact alone does not mean that it'll bring about change in your life. Same is true here. We can be marked by the Spirit. But until we continue to surrender and allow him to change me and ask him to change me, change me from the inside out, search my deepest, darkest corners of my life and change them, that's when we see the power of the Holy Spirit. You know, in Romans, it takes us into a deeper understanding of the Spirit. In Romans 8, 15, this is the truth I want you to hear this morning. You, okay, that's us. You have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Now we call him Abba, Father. For his spirit joins with our spirit to affirm that we are God's children. And since we are his children, We are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share his suffering. Now, there's parts of that that we we like to hear. As you begin to walk through that truth, it is an invitation for more, always more, to become in the spirit of God. But when we look at this, you know, many of us realize that our identity changes We are no longer who we once were, but we are now who Christ has made us because we have been marked by his spirit. We need to begin to look more like Christ than we once did as our own. That is the evidence of the movement of the spirit of God in us. And in this change, we are not just only marked, we are equipped for good works that he has planned before we were even born. That is the power of the Holy Spirit. But equipped for what? What does that look like for us? 
as we take a walk every day, we hear the words marked and equipped for his glory, but it also said what? For his suffering. And many of us say, oh, I'm all about the glory. Let me live in God's glory. That sounds good. But his suffering, I'm being marked by the Spirit for his suffering. I'm trying to get away from suffering. I have enough suffering in my life. I don't need more. But the truth that he's bringing by being marked by his agent of change, the Holy Spirit, is this, that we are going to be empowered, empowered to see victory. God knows this, that life happens, and life happens, it brings pain and suffering. But he says, through the empowering of my spirit, I will give you what you need for today. I promise you. I will allow you to have the provision, the protection that my spirit and my spirit alone can give to you. Do we remember this? What did I say earlier? We have the same spirit that raised Jesus from the grave living in within us. So why would we fear anything that this life can throw at us. We fear because we haven't engaged with the Spirit of God. Because when we engage with the Spirit of God, we begin to experience peace, even in the midst of uncertainty. We begin to have a power that we don't even know where it came from. These are the things that are unexplainable apart from God. And that is what he's called us to live in. That's the signature of God on our lives. Now, I can tell you that it's not always going to look the same, how life shows up. And it's not always going to look the same how God positions you for his glory. And the way that he equips you is the way that he positions you. So we have to be ready to go and trust that if he sends us, he will provide for us all that is needed in that moment. In 1 Corinthians, we see a little bit about the equipping. We're not going to have time to go through all of this today, but I want you to hear this. In 1 Corinthians 12, 4 and following, it says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same spirit is the source of all of them. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but is the same God who does the work in all of us. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. The gift is not given so that we can serve ourselves. The gift is given to serve others, to serve his body, to serve his mission. You know, the thing I love about God is God doesn't create in a cookie-cutter fashion. Each of us are unique and perfectly positioned if we choose to surrender Now, you may not think that you're perfectly positioned. You may look at your life and say, it's a mess. And he says, it's a mess that I can use. You are perfectly positioned for my empowerment. Because this world needs to see that we can rise above the circumstances, that we can push through whatever life brings to us. But hear me in this. Every one of us is promised to be equipped by his Holy Spirit. Not one of us is exempt from that when we surrender our lives to him. He will give us the empowering of his spirit. But God doesn't equip us just to serve ourselves. But in serving others, guess what? We're serving Christ. And that's what it's all about. The spirit of God was given to bring the witness and the vision back to Christ always. The same thing is true for us. You know, we have to ask, is there evidence of change in the action of our faith. Is there evidence? I mean, we could sit here and talk all day about what we should be. We could talk all day about how the Spirit can move. But I want to talk about what the Spirit is doing. I want to talk about the surrender that we're living in. I want to see the evidence of our faith in action. That's what I want to see. Church, I don't want to hear that you're a prayer warrior. I want you to simply pray. I don't want you to tell me that you love people. I want you to love people as you serve them, as you sacrifice with them, as you help them. That's what I want to hear. I don't want to hear that you love to give. I don't want your left hand to know what your right hand is doing. Do it for the glory of God, not for yourself. 
when we experience this change of the Spirit, we begin to lift others up before our own. Imagine that. Could you see what a church could become when we don't live for ourselves, that we begin to live for the glory of God through others? Now it begins to become exciting because now our signature of our life is God, not our own. But you know, there's one great truth, many truths, but this one I love because I've lived in it and I continue to live in it. In Romans 8, 26, I hope that you can identify with me. One of the greatest gifts of having that indwelling spirit and the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. Is there anybody out there that has some weakness? I do. And the Holy Spirit says, I will help you in your weakness. Promised. Promised. He says, for example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings and cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And then it goes on and says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. We read that last week. But see, this is how it works. When we are marked and equipped by his Holy Spirit, we begin to see a life that is changed. It helps us in our weakness. The Spirit pleads on our behalf. Somebody's going to bat for me. Somebody's going to bat for you every day when we have the indwelling of the Spirit. He's pleading on our behalf that we will be victorious. And he's also causing all these things to work together. Because the Spirit moves, the Spirit equips, the Spirit provides, the Spirit orchestrates the perfect plan in our lives. In the midst of chaos, in the midst of destruction, the Spirit can orchestrate his plan to move us for the glory of God. That's what gets exciting. But are we in step with the Spirit? Or not. Too many steps in our lives have been taken in the flesh, which lead us further and further away from God. When we walk in the Spirit of God, we are able to walk in a spirit, a spirit that moves mountains. That's what we have to be as a church. Not be afraid of what today brings, but understand the power that today brings. We are victorious church, and the Spirit is dwelling within each of us, a faith that produces true change. We read on in verse 22. In verse 22 of, of Galatians, what we're going to see here, well, let's, let's begin back with verse 16. It says, so I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. That is the battle. And why I need me, your pastor, why I need the indwelling of the Spirit is so that I can battle the sinful cravings of my flesh. I need that, and so do you. We need to be led so that we can produce godly fruit in our lives. And you read down in verse 22, it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and the desires of their sinful nature to his cross, and crucified them there. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's lead, leading in every part of our lives. The fruit that is produced by the indwelling is peace, is love, is joy. The things apart from the Spirit are the things that we often find in our lives that we find even in the church. But he says if we're living together, we will not find a spirit of gossip, a spirit of anger, a spirit of discord, but a spirit of harmony. That's what brings us together. That's what guides us to be one, though we are many. is through his spirit, recognizing that we are called to bring glory to God. Now, the Holy Spirit is the agent of change. And he can fight the battle, whatever it is. You may be here today battling pride, lust, you may be battling greed, hate, selfishness, whatever the list is. But he says when you are marked by the agent of change, those things can come and those things can go because he's greater than any battle that we will ever face in our lives. 
But church, are we living by the Spirit? Do we have the evidence of fruit before us? Does the world know that we are different? Does the world know what we are following and what we are chasing after? Does the fruit of our lives point to Jesus? Or does the fruit of our lives just point back to the world? I want you to wrestle with that today. Because we are to be marked. And we are to be known to be different because of his indwelling. I want to finish with this scripture this morning. 2 Corinthians 5. Pick it up in verse 4. It says, while we live in these earthly bodies, we groan inside. But it's not that we want to die and get rid of these bodies that clothe us. Rather, we want to put on our new bodies so that these dying bodies will be swallowed up by life. God himself has prepared us for this and as a guarantee has given us his Holy Spirit. True life is not in the pursuit of this world. True life does not come from this physical body. But yet, as we live out this life on this earth, clothe ourselves with true life. It comes through the marking and equipping of his spirit so that we don't have to fear anything, but we can have the joy of the Lord each and every day. Let's pray.